The word of God this morning comes from Psalm 101, a psalm of David. I will sing of steadfast love and justice to you, O Lord. I will make music. I will ponder the way that is blameless. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall be far from me. I will know nothing of evil. Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. I will look with favor on the faithful in the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in the way that is blameless shall minister to me. No one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. Morning by morning, I will destroy all the wicked in the land, cutting off all the evildoers the city of the Lord. As far as the reading of God's word, you may be seated. The believer's journey of faith must take into account the enduring of suffering and evil. We've talked a little bit about that as we've journeyed through the Psalms and as we come to understand the different characteristics, the traits of who God is. But one of the areas that is difficult, one of the areas that's at times even troubling, is how we must deal with suffering and evil. Now, when we talk about suffering and evil, there's quite a spectrum. And we could talk about the brokenness and suffering of this life, floods that ravage communities health crises, and the like. But there's a part of suffering in this world and evil in this world that's a little more complicated, a little more challenging. And that is when we see the blatant display of evil, those intended towards evil. Now, sometimes when we as believers address that issue and we confront that issue, The world sometimes does not like us. (laughs) Oh, that's right. You're those Old Testament people where God would just smite tens of thousands of people. That's how God deals with evil. We kind of get lumped into that camp, don't we? But the challenge for us this morning is, well, what do we do with evil? And you might think, well, that's obvious, you know. I mean, evil's bad. God is good. That's... Okay, settled. But living in a particularly a post-Christian era in this land, you and I run into it more and more and more. So how do we believers do that? How do we how do we understand how God deals with evil and how do we deal with it? How do we confront it? How do we work through it? The psalm this morning that we're considering is written by King David. Of course, he's, he's king of the land. His, his word uh, is final. He has authority. And as he talks about that authority today, he's talking from the perspective as one who has devoted his life to God. In fact, you know, it's been said that David, he was a man after God's own heart. But we also know he wasn't perfect. And yet here he is, he writes this psalm from the perspective of as king, as a follower of Yahweh, here's how I'm going to deal with evil. And so as we consider how David responds to it, we see a glimmer of how God looks at evil as well. So I invite you to follow along as we move through that and I was going to click my slides, but I don't have a clicker. So you're on today. You ready? Here we go. David begins by saying, I will sing of 
love and justice. And I want you to just keep those two words in mind because those are critical for understanding how we deal with evil in this world. There's the love side, the compassion side, the the part that Jesus says, you know, love your enemies, pray for those who who persecute you. So you you have that piece of it. And and we certainly can imagine love in a place of suffering and, and hardship. It's a lot harder to think of love and compassion when we're dealing with people who blatantly do evil. And of course, we're not saying we're loving what they do. The question is, can we, can we separate out the sin for a moment and, and see them as an image bearer of God? Because isn't it, isn't it a bit counterintuitive when Jesus says, love your enemies, and you're thinking, yeah, they're my enemy. <laughs> I don't like this person. This person is mean to me. This person does evil towards me. And you want me to love this person? And of course, we could feel that tension of, yeah, I know I'm a believer. Yes, I know I'm forgiven. Yes, I've received this grace. But to overcome that with a measure of love and compassion is difficult. And when I, when I think on this theme, I'm often drawn to where Jesus is sitting on that hillside as he's about ready to head into Jerusalem for the week of the crucifixion. And he pauses and he weeps for the city. And you know what he says? Oh, man, if you knew how close you were going to come to seeing the kingdom of God manifest among you, and you are going to miss it. That's the voice of compassion. And so when we deal with evil, one of the things we pray for, one of the things that we nurture in our soul is an awareness of, can we see the heart? Can we see the soul of the person who's doing the evil, engaged in the, in the promoting of suffering? Can we see them as one yet to be redeemed? Can, can we have that level of compassion? Because let's admit, brokenness and evil functions like a barrier at times to our ability to see that person. We, we're like, mm, don't, don't want anything to do with that person. And we're not saying engage in what they're doing, but can you see them as one yet to be redeemed? So that's, that's one part of this, but the other part of this is indeed justice. The part that says there is a right and there is wrong. There there is that place that's, there's a definitive standard. There's a moral standard. There, There is a clear biblical standard of this is right, this is wrong. Now, why are these two so important? Because in our broken, fallen world, sometimes we default to one or the other. We, we kind of enter an arena of love and compassion and affirming and saying, oh, it's a, you know, just, just God loves everybody. Everybody's going to get saved. Let's just love everybody. And totally ignore the right and wrong. And sometimes we can get pretty zealous about right and wrong. I mean, we can get fired up. It's like, that is wrong. You may not do that. And forget to love. Very important as we deal with the brokenness, the sin and evil of this world, it's love and justice. Now, in engaging in this practice of love and justice, which is hard. It takes discipline. It takes hard work, training of the mind and heart with the word of God to understand what right and wrong is and to develop a heart of compassion. But I will tell you, as the second point highlights, as David alludes to in the next verse, hey, Lord, when are you going to come to me? This is hard, Lord. And, and I will tell you, sometimes in showing both love and compassion and justice is lonely work. 
You feel isolated. You feel like, am I the only one seeing this? Because sometimes when you, when you exercise that love and justice, for some, it's not loving enough. <laughs> and sometimes when, when, when you love, there are those that say, well, where's the justice? And then there's this sense of, this doesn't feel fair. When you stand on the word of God, when you are devoted to following him, and you pursue both love and justice, there are times you're going to feel all alone. There are going to be times where you're going to feel like you are a voice in the wilderness. I share that in part because we need to understand that part of the tactic of the enemy, our spiritual enemy, is very much like what we see displayed in, in the, 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 the wildlife around us. You ever see those videos, you know, of out in, in, in Africa, you know, the lion is sitting in the weeds. A herd of antelope goes by. What is the, what is the lion and the, 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 the herd of lionesses, what do they do? They spot the weak one and they isolate them. The enemy wants you to think in your pursuit of doing love and justice that you are alone. He wants to convince you and he wants you to think you're all by yourself in this so as to throw in the towel or go weak on love or justice or both. That is a lie because you are never alone. I think of Goliath, you know? Goliath is looking at David. <laughs> Goliath's thinking, who are you coming with sticks and stones? You know, I'm, I'm Goliath. I got, I got Philistines with me. We're going we're gonna to take you out, David. And what does David say? Yeah, but I'm, I'm on the Lord's side. The Lord is on my side. The armies of the Lord, you can't see. Are on my side. And of course, we know how that story ended, didn't we? The people of God need to understand that in this world, as we engage in this, uh, this endeavor of love and justice, you are never alone. When you are doing it for the purposes of God, when you are faithful to his word, the armies of God are on your side. Do not think for a moment, as, as the culture would want you to think, you are alone. You are a fringe person. You're an extremist. No, 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 no. When you line up with the word of God, you've got the armies of God on your side. Do not think for a moment you are alone. David's question here is simply one of saying, God, you know this is hard. I need you here with me. And God is very happy to answer that with his presence. But as we continue to deal with this issue of evil... As the psalm goes on here in the verses 3 and 4, it says this, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. The psalmist is saying, I have purpose. I have set in my heart. I am going after what is right all the time. There's a, a persistence. There's a commitment in his soul to say, I am not going to give on this. Now, we don't know when this psalm was written, if it was written after his encounter with Nathan the prophet and Bathsheba and that whole incident, we don't know. But David understood, understood the necessity of a commitment, a resolve in his spirit when confronting evil. And there's a set apartness that happens by default when you and I, in a post Christian culture, draw the line. When we say, this is right, this is wrong, you're going to stand out. Because the lie of the current culture is, is that it, we, we're just going to blur the lines. It's gray. You know, uh, I saw an ad or listened to an ad this last week that, that talked about a particular cause in a people group and, and said that, that 
all truth is relevant and, and truths are evolving. What? Truths are evolving? Truth is truth. And again, in this post-Christian world, you and I have to be dialed in here, folks. It's very deceptive. It's, it's very subtle. This, this graying of lines and this wanting to, to, to give in on these things. Folks, we can ill afford that. And David's resolve is a good reminder to us this morning. We must be resolved in heart and soul and mind and strength that it is God's truth and nothing else. And I will promise you one of two things is going to happen. As you dial into the truth of God's word, as you are resolved, one of two things will happen. One, you could have people come to you and say, I want what you have. Because they're living in the emptiness of the cycle of the, the, the theology of the culture. They're, 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 they're being deceived and they're empty, but they see a resolve in you. They see a, a foundation in you and they're like, I want that. So, One's resolve can result in those coming to know Jesus. Or you're just going to tick off a lot of people. When you draw a line in the sand and you are resolved and you're going to say, this is the truth, nothing else, this is the truth, you're going to tick people off. Why? Because their truth doesn't line up with God's truth. It's, it's like that phenomenon sitting in a dark room. You know, your, your, your eyes and body get acclimated to that dark room. You're resting. Then that blessed child of yours comes running in the room, flips the lights on. <laughs> your life as a resolved follower of Jesus Christ can sometimes feel like that to those who are walking in darkness. Can't take it. Don't want it. Get out of here. Saw that on the streets all the time when we, when we brought kids through New York City. There were those like, oh, yeah, you know. And there were those that were, well, saying words we can't repeat. People will be drawn, and people will be repulsed. Welcome to living as a believer of Jesus Christ in the 21st century in America. Get used to it. It's going to intensify. The morality of our culture is heading a direction. This is only going to intensify, folks. And please, by the way, just a footnote and a side here. Please don't look to the political system to solve this. It's not a political system issue. It's an issue of the heart only hearts need a change here. Which leads us kind of to this next point, and that is this. Righteousness sustains a society. Evil undermines a society. David knew. David knew from history. He had a, he had a whole history of, of generation after generation. He saw the generations that were faithful to God. Blessing flowed. Uh, wars were won. There was favor. There was blessing. David knew that when the people of God were fully devoted all in, blessing happened. But he also knew full well when the, the idols and, and, and Baal were introduced from the, from the neighboring countries, it corroded, it toxified the culture, dissolved the culture. Historians look back at, at a number of civilizations that collapsed, Roman Empire being one of those. The Roman Empire, phenomenal, phenomenal impact. I mean, the roads and the waterways and everything they implemented, impressive army, the whole thing. Rome didn't fall from outside forces. It imploded a decadent, immoral society that revered its human emperor as God, imploded. 
Righteousness sustains. Evil destroys. That's been since the the fall in the garden. This is not rocket science. Let me say this, and and, and this is where... You know, some of the tension of how we, we, we must deal with this comes into play. You know, we, we often quote that Second Chronicles 7 passage, you know, if my people humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal their land. And we make appeal to that. Folks, that's written to us. If the land is going to survive, it starts with the responsibility and at times the culpability of the people of God. If if the people of God yield on the truth, if the people of God give in to evil, we are responsible for the demise of a society. We cannot be poking fingers and pointing fingers if we've not stayed resolved in, in pursuing love and justice, we are part of the problem. And so again, David's resolve in this psalm is, is a, just a reminder to all of us how important it is as believers to be all in, fully devoted for the purposes of God. The last observation is this. Zealousness for what's right and taking a stand against evil honors the Lord. You look at the tenor of verse 7 and 8. No one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. I am not going to tolerate evil. I am all in for the sake of the kingdom of God. And I imagine David, like all of us, sometimes needed to just say that out loud to remind ourselves, no, as for me and my house, this is what we're going to do. We're all in. And David knew that that honored the Lord. In fact, there was this, you look at the zealousness of verse 8. Morning by morning... I'm not going to engage the wicked of land. I'm going to destroy the wicked of the land. Now, this does not mean for us to take up swords and weapons and go out and start shooting people. The church tried that in the Crusades. It didn't work. Please don't do that. But David's zealousness reminds us it's not just about confronting evil. It's about honoring God in all that we do. Our end goal must always be in a spirit of love and justice to give God glory. And we only need to look as far as the ministry of Jesus to be reminded how that worked. We saw those those moments of love and compassion in the middle of brutal evil, toxic religiosity, and Jesus showed love and compassion and called on the carpet... Right and wrong. But if anything, when he's hanging on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was all in. He was all in for the sake of the glory of his Father. And as a result, you and I are saved. challenge of the psalm here this morning is not being able to pick out evil and doing something about it. Our number one resolve must be, for the glory of God, I will love in the middle of brokenness, messiness, and yes, even evil. I will have compassion, but I will not shy back from saying this is right and this is wrong. And at times you will go it alone, but just know our Savior went there first on our behalf. And the armies of the Lord are on your side. Amen? Let's pray.
Gracious God, we thank you from the reminder of your servant David, a zealousness for you. And we thank you through the power of your Holy Spirit, we can come into that place of zealousness, that place of resolve to say we're all in. Because we, Lord, we know that in and of ourselves, we are broken people, and if left to ourselves, we will make a mess of it. But by the power of your Holy Spirit, the grace that you have shown us in Jesus Christ, we can come into the messiest of places, the most uh, vile of circumstances, and have love and compassion. But Lord, give us those eyes, that wisdom to know, here's right, here's wrong, and Lord, the courage to call it out. Lord, we're, we're living in a time that's a bit unknown to us of, of, of where your, your word is being constantly challenged. The truth of your word is being constantly challenged. And, and your church is being challenged to not only show love and compassion, but resolve for right and wrong. Lord, help us. Lord, stand with us. That almighty hand that you have displayed since the beginning of time, Lord, we ask for your hand to be upon us. As we seek to give honor and glory to you in our love and justice. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.